Good morning and welcome back to COVID-19 Mental Health Chats. My name is Elise. I am a licensed professional counselor and wellness coach. This morning we are going to do a little tutorial and conversation about, um, about self-care and using creative visual arts to help us identify our feelings, process our emotions, and um, potentially even communicate it a little more effectively with those that we really love and care, with, care about the most. So for this particular exercise, which is called Dual Emotions, and it's from a, um, it's sourced from a program called Peace Love Studios. Uh, I became a Peace Love creator through a generous, uh, grant from the Greater Columbus Arts Council and uh, was able to become Ohio's first Peace Love Creator. They are a studio that creates expressive arts curriculum and um, it is strictly expressive arts, not clinical counseling. So this is very approachable for anybody, no matter what your background is and what you would use it for. So for this exercise, we start off by having a little bit of an introduction with whomever you're doing it with, whether it's just checking in with yourself or with other people. And um, I have a I have a name a name sticker. So we'll start off by checking in with ourselves, and we write on it our name and what gives us peace of mind in that moment in that day. And it doesn't have to be something that has given you peace of mind your entire life and um, for years and years. It doesn't have to be anything that's a huge commitment like that just in this day. So uh, my name is Elise. And what gives me peace of mind this morning is a nice cup of tea. So I'll write that here. And this morning, I am having a lemon tea from Stash. So uh, with that, we start with just a greeting with whomever we're doing this with. And it helps to have greetings like a hello and a goodbye for a sense of beginning and a sense of closure, especially when we're doing um, processing of our emotions, whether it's creative, nonverbal or verbal um, because it indicates to our, our bodies of, hey, there's a beginning and there's an ending and it's not just indefinitely continuing, um, which is really helpful when we're talking about things as personal as our emotions and our, and our unique experiences. The other materials that I have today, I have a box of markers, um, oil pastels, some soft pastels, some cardstock paper of lots of different colors. And um, these other cutout shapes of half a face. That one has a nose. And the other half of the face where you can see the, the negative of the nose. Um, so you don't have to have these particular materials to make this happen. You can easily draw in a, a half shape profile onto a piece of paper and the other, other side with another half face. Um, or it could just be symbols. It could be two ovals that you draw on a piece of paper. It, it doesn't have to be this particular thing for, um, for this exercise to work. They can be adapted in the ways that work best for you. So in dual emotions, the name of that exercise is called dual emotions because what we're trying to do in the process of this particular exercise is to identify the um, multiple emotions that can be evident in any experience. So for example, uh, first thing when you wake up in the morning, you might have a couple emotions of yay, it's another new day. But you might also feel a little bit grumpy. So, you know, those are a couple of emotions right there. You might also feel like curious. What am I gonna eat for breakfast this morning? Am I gonna have breakfast or am I gonna sleep in? Um, in, in these times of COVID. And uh, 
Another example might be when you are having to face a move. Um, it might be exciting to move somewhere new, see something, see a different change of pace and new scenery, but it might also be really sad because you're having to leave the community that you built up together and participated in creating so many memories together. Those are just a couple emotions that could exist in the same experience. So similarly, um, you know, using those as metaphor examples, thinking of COVID and how each day in quarantine, we may have different experiences and different uh, emotions in this process. It can be helpful to see what those emotions are and how those two or three or four or five or more emotions interact together. Um, and when things feel super confusing and difficult to navigate, it helps to put things down in a visual format or a written format so that you can have it in front of you like an object, which is much more manageable than something invisible and hard to reach um, because it's not quite tangible. So um, out, of all the, out of all the cardstock color options, I think the one that I'm drawn to the most today is this bright yellow one. It feels like, I don't know why, but I, I'm drawn to it. And so I'm gonna use a bright yellow surface for my background. And for the pieces without, with the nose, I'm sorry, with the nose, I feel drawn to the color, um, let's see, I feel drawn to this color, teal. And for this section, this piece of paper that is the negative of the nose, I feel drawn to the color, hmm, I'm drawn to orange. There doesn't have to be any rhyme or reason to it when you're picking your colors. <laughs> it's very simple. It's, uh, there's not, uh, it's not meant to be intimidating. It's meant to be, um, you know, just following your intuition, whatever your gut is feeling that day. So these are the two that I feel. And I'm trying to think of um, th how this exercise can be helpful for these times of COVID. So I'm going to be, as part of this demonstration, thinking about coronavirus and um, the state of affairs where different states are opening up, different states are staying closed, stay at home orders on and off and the medical research you know there's no longitudinal studies anywhere in the world so um there, there's everything is just up in the air there's a lot of questions about and not a, not a whole lot of answers but a lot of hypotheses so um i'm just gonna think about that but i don't really know what the feelings are yet uh, so that's you know that's why i'm doing this exercise to help identify what those might be and um and in the process of doing that, I'm going to just place these on the page in a way that makes sense to me, that just feels like, oh, this is kind of how COVID feels to me. Um, again, it doesn't have to make a whole lot of sense. It's just about finding something that really, um, really just makes sense to you. So I think what I'm finding, so what I'm doing on the page that you may or may not be able to see is I'm looking at it like this. Like, does this make sense to me with two faces that are far apart from each other? Does it make sense to me that they're close to each other? Does it make sense that they're intertwined or the heads are touching or just the mouths are touching or just the noses are touching? Does it make sense for them to be like this where they're not facing each other right now um you know this is for for everybody it's going to feel a little bit different and whatever you know the way that feels right to your intuition um is right it, there, there's no right or wrong answer in the process of doing expressive arts so there's a lot of um you know there's a lot of room I also want to share that in the process of doing any peace love modules, such as dual emotions, 
um, like we're like I'm demonstrating today, if you're especially if you're doing it in a group of two or more people, you are always welcome to share as much or as little as you feel comfortable. And sometimes you might not be able to find the words, even if you're able to put some of the actual physical art materials together, and that's okay. You know, your your words might come later. So um, always always know that you can share as much as you feel comfortable sharing um, with yourself what, what, while you're journaling or with others if you're doing this together. So I think the place where I'm landing is, I think this feels pretty close to what I'm feeling about the whole COVID situation. Um, so I think I'll put this down on the page. And I have some tape so that it stays on the page. I'm going to tape that down. You can use glue, you can use um, Velcro, you can use whatever you want to make things stay together. Or if what you're feeling is actually they shouldn't be stuck on the page and they should be able to move around freely, you could do that too. There's no rules to this. Um, all right, so as I'm looking at these two sides and how close they are and yet still separated, I feel like maybe this is what, this is the portion of the exercise where I'm going to try to identify what's going on on both sides. And if I know, if you know, as you do this, the emotion or the thought that is associated with either side, then you can name it on the page. If you don't really know, then you can just express it on either side with phrases or symbols or um, images that you draw on or objects that you glue and, and tack on on top of it, 3D, 3D objects. For me, I feel like I need to start with some free association word writing uh, for, for this particular example, because I don't actually know what the emotions are. So um, the blue side, some of the words that are coming to mind as I look at that piece of paper is um, confusion and fear in the nose area, mm. caution around the mouth, confusion in the head area, and Oh, and then in the orange side, I'm feeling a little bit of uncertainty around the nose area and effort on the eyes. Oh, and I feel effort on the blue side too. And I feel, hmm, feel sad on the chin and under the chin of the of the orange side. Sad and sad on the two sides of both face pieces. So so far, what I've got is. Um, some words on my particular dual emotion face map or art map. And I'm noticing something emerge for me personally as I'm making this. I'm noticing that there is effort and effort matched on both sides of the eye area and sad and sad on both sides of the, um, of the chin area and in the external and in the external environment, which makes me feel like, is there potential for bridges? Maybe building bridges of understanding or connection, something to help these two sides come together. I don't know. I don't have any answers, but I see the potential for some building of bridges. Um, and where there is fear and uncertainty and caution, 
I wonder if, you know, maybe there needs to be like a flashlight of some kind. Um, because maybe they're, you know, maybe they're all in the dark. Maybe they, maybe there needs to be a little bit of um, teaching by credible experts um, who are treating and actually directly handling the, the, the virus itself. Um, I don't know what else would be needed. I think in fear and uncertainty, things of comfort could be really helpful. So something to symbolize comfort, I'm going to put a fluffy blanket. And so I, I drew in some, some, other, some other little symbols there. And, and at this point, I'm going to go to my chalk pastels because this material can easily be smudged and manipulated and moved around on surfaces. So I'm gonna choose this black, black color um, soft pastel because I'm feeling around the fear and uncertainty, you know, thinking about maybe a flashlight is needed for some direction and a guide um, in these times. Maybe, there, maybe it feels like we're in danger, or I feel like there's, you know, we're, we're in um, an environment where there's not a whole lot of light. There's a lot of darkness. Um, again, just using that as a metaphor of like not having all the answers and um, the difficult feelings that come up with that. And, um, and yet, what I'm also noticing is I'm spreading and manipulating this dark the dark, the darkness around of where the fear and the uncertainty and the caution are, and then the sad underneath it, I'm noticing that there's the two efforts on top of that, the effort that is in the eyes of um, seeking and looking for help, looking for change, looking for solutions. And now I'm noticing that I'm feeling hope. So I'm going to write that word hope in. as well as a question mark. There's, and the way that I feel about hope is that's a, I think that's more of a bright thing. It's more of a positive thing. So at least, you know, for me, so I'm gonna use a light color, this peachy color. And manipulate that around those colors. And now it looks like this. So it's harder to see some of that light color that's on top. And it's easier to see the dark colors underneath. And I'm feeling like, oh, wow, this is, you know, that makes a lot of sense. But it feels like there's so much of a dichotomy. Um, at least, you know, again, for me, because this is my demo. And it, it's going to take even more effort to focus on those positive, those that hope, that positive space up here, the lighter space, to grow that space and kind of push down or make these dark clouds go somewhere else, um, whatever that actually means. But again, since this is self-expression exercise, this isn't about you know society or politics or whatever. This is just how can I move those dark things down and, and place them in appropriate places for me, right? Um, as part of the self-care exercise. And how can I increase that positive space in my mind? Um, so those are some of the things that I'm noticing from doing this exercise. So um, I think the way that I would explain this kind of piece then, now that I've done it, um, to someone I'm trying to communicate with, say like my, um, my family or my significant other or a friend. I think I, if when, um, you know, when we check on each other, I might tell them, oh, you know what? I, I noticed that there are times that I feel 
like I feel uncertain and that my footing is unsure, um, that the ground feels a little bit shaky in these times. But I have a hope, I have, I have this, and I think I wanna focus on that. So maybe in our conversations, we can focus on that. Or if I really need some, you know, if I need extra support, maybe we can kind of process this together as friends, as family, and, um, and be there for each other about this piece so that they can give some support to help decrease the impact of this, that's, of the dark pieces that's happening. Um, and I might even show them my art piece so that they could kind of see and interpret for themselves what they might be noticing that I haven't noticed from what I, from what I made. And in their, in their interpretations, they might be able to enlighten me to something that I wasn't even aware I was expressing on the page. So there's all these open possibilities for communication when we use some visual aids. Um, so at this point in the tutorial demonstration, I would like to explain a little bit about how it's helpful to use our uh, creativity and expressive mediums of art or journaling um, to process these really difficult times. Um, our brain, and I'm going to give a very simplistic explanation because um, this isn't a neuroscience lecture. So um, our brain has two hemispheres, the left hemisphere and the right hemisphere, and they constantly share with each other our experiences, but through their own interpretations. So the left brain is dominant with numbers, letters, words, and uh, paragraphs, and it creates analyses of patterns and structures. The right side is dominant with all of our sensorial aspects of an experience. The, um, the taste, the sounds, the sights, the touches, the textures, and the feelings in a given experience. Having one of any of our experiences sit in just one of the two hemispheres, left or right, uh, really disadvantages us so that we can't fully understand <clears throat> our experiences. And so what helps to help, uh, what helps the brain in times of fear or trauma or um, pandemic like now is to do some creative expression to help those experiences that start in the sensorial space of what we're feeling and as we're just simply moving through our, our lives to then help it move towards the left side, to start to put some words to it, to start to put some analyses towards it. And then the left brain makes an initial draft, draft one, which, you know, from, from elementary school days, we know that draft one is, is nothing. It's just, um, <laughs> It's, it's silliness, but it's important because it's the first step. And then it pings it back to the right side as we continue to have experiences and the right side pings back more information to the, to the left side. And then left side brings up draft and it like mulls over draft two, three, four, and it sends it over and there's draft five and um, the right brain pings back some more information. And then the left brain takes that new information, reprocesses it, pings it back, draft six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10. Um, and it goes back and forth, back and forth until your body can crystallize it in a way that it understands as, okay, this is a memory and it stores it, it stores it for you appropriately. So um, that said, thank you so much for being part of this conversation and um, this tutorial portion. Right now, we're going to move to the Q&A section of our time before we close out. So um, I would love to invite you to share any of your thoughts or your questions about um, using visual art and maybe, the, maybe even this activity of dual emotions for self-care and or communication. I think my question is about when you mentioned about the left brain and the right brain and that stuff, and what happens if one's dominant and the other one's like literally silent? 
it's like you can't really uh, that top that other part is like the logical part is awakened but while well, the uh, other part is just like dormant and that stuff and you don't feel anything or sense anything how you can respond to that situation yeah that's a really great question so that's actually um a really common concern that i i run into with so many people because the world that we live in thrives on left brain dominance um especially our western culture post enlightenment people really like to focus on what are my thoughts and what are your thoughts and how can we talk about it without being emotional <laughs> and um, not involving any emotions. So given our context, that is very, very common um, to, to feel and to, um, and, to, and to then have questions about. So given that it's so common that way, I'd like to just, first of all, normalize what you're asking. And secondly, um, I'd like to, I'd like to give a little encouragement that even though that side feels so dominant in everybody, even those who have, and I know you didn't mention this, um, but to be inclusive of, you know, other, others as well, as I answer your question, even those who have had such severe trauma that portions of them have shut down out of a survival instinct, even for them, that other side is still, is still present. What it's waiting for is an environment that feels safe enough to then open up. Um, and so what I mean by that is to access it, to tap into it, I would love for you to, or anybody, not necessarily, but anybody who is feeling that kind of question to create, to create and then enter spaces that feel safe enough it doesn't have to be perfectly safe perfection isn't the goal but just safe enough to first of all feel privacy um that that's an element of creating that safe space mm -hmm. um having some form of boundary that is reliable that also contributes to having a safe space so meaning to say like instead of processing your artistic and or journalistic or other creative self-expression processing in a space that is very wide open that anyone can walk into. Mm -hmm. Choose a space that has a door that can, that can shut and maybe can lock. Um, so you know, physiologically, like your body just knows like, this is my space for processing right now. Um, and, and then setting aside a time when you know that you don't have to be interrupted by Slack messages or emails and work PMs and all these things that have to take your attention to, to reserve as just your time to process anything. And the third thing I'd like to introduce is um, that I, I would like to invite those who struggle with this to um, be gentle with yourself, with themselves, that no matter what comes out on the page, whether you're choosing to do it in writing or choosing to do it with visual elements or three-dimensional motifs, whatever method you choose to process, to begin the processing, whatever you're able to put out there is perfect and it's great. Um, your draft one might look like one word. It might look like a singular period in a journal entry just a dot and it might just be writing the date down that is all completely okay wherever you start and if all you do is um you know going off of that example just having one journal entry where all you write is the date and there's nothing else on that space and the next day you come and flip the page and all you write is the date and then the next day you come and all you write is the date and maybe your intention, I want to try to express myself and get more in touch with myself, those are all really successful. Because over time, as you continue to feed into yourself, be gentle with yourself to connect with yourself on both sides of the brain, you'll get to see a pattern, or, or not a pattern, a flow of growth, where 
eventually that side of the right side of your brain starts to feel more comfortable to come forward with some kind of expression, whatever the expression is. Other times, you know, some people are very um, tactile and three-dimensional with how they like to experience life. So they might put into their creative self-expression, here is my used napkin from a certain meal that I shared over Zoom with my mother who lives in a different place and we can't see each other because she's immunocompromised. So I don't want to risk anything. We just did, we just did a video meal together. And that, that napkin means so much to, to express and to symbolize that meal that was shared together. This is just an example. That can also, if that is significant for a person, they can put that into their art, expressive, self-expressive self-care catalog to then see what the progression has been. And then once they see those progressions, those day by day, or whenever they're able to do a week by week um, creative works, their left brain, because it's so refined and so honed from the culture that we live in and the way that most of us are raised, um, your, your left brain will automatically start to look for ways to analyze and understand and put words to those symbolic pieces. Again, there's no right answers to what a person has to say or what they have to express visually or creatively. All of it is correct because it's about the process of what, what comes forward. Thank you so much for your question. It kind of brings another question in this. Um, kind of reminds me of just like, I think for me, I've never experienced emotions very much, you know? Um, and then growing up, I always did my own thing and really never expressed my emotions very well or at all and that stuff. And basically, I was basically introvert most of the time. And, and like, I've never, I, I went to a therapist one time and she was saying that because of my interaction, when I receive some type of love, it's hard to me express it because she was saying that I was never nourished as a child and that stuff. And so um, I think is how can I get used to that? You know? That, That's a good question. Yeah. I feel like there's a few pieces to your question. So yeah. um, I, I'm going to try to answer each portion. So first of all, thank you for your trust and for your vulnerable self-disclosure. Um, I want to honor that and do the best I can to mm -hmm. offer a couple thoughts. The first is that um, in my clinical, in my background of training, I have had multiple supervisors who are excellent. And I feel very fortunate to have had those supervisors because I got to see a number of different perspectives. There is one type of perspective that says, okay, if you've had adverse childhood experiences or ACEs, then you are more likely to have all these negative things happen or feel experienced as an adult. And um, oftentimes in those conversations, there isn't really a, a flow that naturally goes to, okay, well, what can we do so that the adult feels happy and has positive experiences? So it's kind of like a, in a way, unintentionally, it becomes a very negative conversation because it's like, here's what you experienced. This is what you probably experience later. Sorry. <laughs> um, that's like one kind of conversation that I often run into. The other kind of conversation that I tend to run into is you've had these experiences as a child, as an adolescent, or as an adult. And now as an adult, it's really hard to pivot back to a, an optimal place, a place that is preferred and more positive and, um, and can move forward without hangups, wounds, and other um, stuck points. So um, that might exist, but with 
a, 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 a very important question that follows it is, but was that experience triggering something that you were meant to suffer with? Like, is it truly, truly genetic? Um, have you had a spinal tap, for example, to find out if um, depression and those chemical imbalances are truly there in your brain um, that require medication? And the, the follow question of, is this genetic? Is it hereditary? Um, have other members in your family had spinal taps, et cetera? So is it really rooted in something that was meant to be and is just going to, you know, continue? For the rest of your life or was it an event was it an interruption that um, may have occurred in infancy as a child as an adolescent as an adult that has made it hard to adjust back to normalcy and all you need are evidence-based scientific interventions to bring you back um so given that i've had supervisors who you, you know, they're, they're on the spectrum of those, that type of conversation. Um, I chose to pursue certain methods of treatment that can help bring people back <laughs> and also look at the existing, uh, the existing skills and resources that are part of human physiology to help a person self care and become resilient. So one of those things that um, one of those things that builds up resiliency and self-care is from an expressive arts perspective, as well as laughter therapy perspective and positive psychology. Um, positive psychology was developed by psychologists who noticed and did research on um, people groups who are in really difficult circumstances, war-torn areas, generational poverty, all these environmental issues that made them question how you continue to make babies, get married, have families, make friends, have a job. Like, how do you function so well in the midst of tragedy all around you? And, um, and so positive psychology and resilience, the study of resiliency came out of that. Um, uh, and then laughter therapy too was developed by a psychologist named um, Dr. Steve Wilson, who I, I learned it from. He um, worked in prison psychology and counseling for most of his, his career. And he noticed that even in a situation like prison, where there's no freedom and it's a maximum security, people were able to be resilient and positive. What is that? And one of the things that he noticed was that the human body is able to laugh naturally across the world, across cultures, no matter what your developmental ability is or disability is, no matter what your um, intelligence, your IQ scores might be, no matter what your em emotional intelligence scores might be, no matter your culture, nothing like that. Laughter starts in infancy and when it's tapped into and elicited the practice of laughter, the practice of um, positive shifting, then the body responds very naturally to, um, to begin to shift towards a more positive space that is then more able to process emotions that previously may not have felt safe because of environmental conditioning and what a person has learned or traumas um, from the past, or even if it's a genetic issue, that a person uh, physiologically people are still able to, they're, they've evolved to be able to laugh um, even before they learn how to speak words. So, you know, laughter is part of that right brain kind of communication that's not verbal. Um, lastly, um, Lastly, I feel like a piece of information to share with what you self-disclosed is given that it's been um, difficult to, um, to even see yourself as someone who has emotions to convey, um, I would just start from there. I think that's 
that's such a that's such a huge insight that you have about yourself and that others might also share with you. I think a lot of people would would identify and empathize with that aspect um, because again, you know, like I mentioned before, we're in a very left brain dominant society. So um, it's totally okay. That's a great place to start. And from that um, from that insight, what I would be curious of is a few different things. Um, maybe is it would you I, would you feel that it's appropriate logically again since emotions don't really feel familiar to you but logically does it feel like not having emotions is a loss of some kind um or that it makes connection more challenging more difficult relationally um if it dies and, and these are all hypothetical because again like i said at the beginning of this video you can always share as much or as little as is comfortable for you. Um, I mean, you don't have to share anything at all either with these questions. So these are hypothetical questions right now. Um, or if there is loss, then I would surmise maybe there is some grief attached to that. And grief has various layers of emotions that come with it, physiologically and emotionally. Um, and there's 11 different types of grief. I, I made a I made a different um, video to help share and identify what type of grief people may be experiencing in these times. So that might be a reference point. Another question I have is, you know, coming again from a logical place, maybe not having to experience too many emotions was of benefit to you. Maybe it meant that it saved you from having to be as disturbed as you observe some other people to be and what are some of those benefits and how does you know if, if it's seen as a benefit there could be the emotion of relief or there could be the continued emotion of oh this feels really safe to me so i feel secure i feel secure and not anxious and not worried and not fearful about not having to deal with emotions that I perceive are dangerous. So then a follow up question to that is, if that's the case, which emotions that other people seem to have feel threatening to have? Again, from that logical place, because you may be left brain dominant, very logical, very, very intellectual. So what seems threatening on a logical level, what are those pieces? And then that could you know, open some more doors for conversation. So these are just rhetorical questions because again, I don't want to put, I don't want to put you in a place where you have to self-disclose anything that you don't have the answers for, that you don't feel comfortable sharing. But I really appreciate your question. It's such a good question and one that um, is very common. Lots of people ask similar questions, even outside of this, you know, definitely outside of the Zoom meeting as I as I do my um, the volunteer and my professional work. So thank you for sharing that. We have time for, I think, just one more question. Would either of you like to share a question before we close out? That's all the questions I have. If I have more questions, myself, I might uh, message you on Facebook. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. And also feel free to share into the, um, the self-care group as well. Okay. There's many good people. And I'm sure that people would love to share like, Oh, this is what worked for me, and you know, et cetera, et cetera, to really demonstrate that you're not alone in your experience, um, whatever you know. Whatever you might have. Okay, one more, one more, I guess. Yeah. So, when working with, so say, I do this with my kids because we homeschool. Um, how much do you push for them? My kids are eight and eleven. How much do you push for them to share? what they drew or do you just let it be yeah. should you push for them to verbalize that is such a great question so um that's a common question too <laughs> so i, I want to normalize that as well lots of parents ask similar questions of okay i've gotten I, i've gotten the model now i get the structure i i kind of get the <clears throat> one two three four five, two, two, two. But, oh, can you hear me? Uh-oh. 
Oh, she froze now. Yeah. <laughs> I think I'll, um, I'll keep going forward to answer the question. Okay, she's back. She's back. I'm okay. back on. Yay! Okay. <laughs> Hi, Julia. I was like, no! <laughs> <laughs> if, if we get frozen again, I'll just keep going forward. Yes. It's recorded, yep. and then you can see it. Okay. Um, upload it? Okay. So it's a common question that lots of parents ask because um, at least, you know, I, I guess I've been blessed that the majority of the parents I've met are amazing and wonderful and like want to do the best with everything, like any tool or resource that they get for um, communicating with their kids. So um, first of all, I just want to acknowledge like that's a common question. Thank you so much. And also you're an amazing parent. And um, with that said, to um, answer your actual question, it is totally okay for your kids to not know how to answer or how to explain their artwork. They might only be able to say, you know, I'll just use this as an example, this is an orange side and that's a blue side and they're not touching. And that might be the end of it. That might not, they, they might not know what to say. They might say, I like getting my hands messy and I like spreading that black around. And again, I'm just using this as an example. They might make something totally different. Um, than what, they probably would make something totally different than what I made here. Or they might say, um, you know, lately, I'm just thinking about this word a lot. Like, I'm obsessed with this word. I, don't, I might not feel it at all, but I'm just obsessed with it. Like, that might be all that they have to say. Whatever they have to say is totally okay because the child's brain is in development until age 25. It's not fully developed until they're 25 years old. And that's from a medical perspective. From a mental health perspective, it's kind of all over the place. Um, it's a softer science, so people will talk about it from like a feminist perspective or a cultural perspective or a you know whatever perspective. So it's more theoretical. But um, physically speaking, medically speaking, the brain finishes being developed at age 25. So your children may initially say, you know what, this is what I'm able to say today. And then as they look back on their, their piece, they might say, you know, I think that kind of helps me understand seeing it in retrospect, how I felt back then. And I think what it was, was blah, blah, blah for me at that time. But right now, like two weeks later, six years later, whatever amount of time later, I can appreciate that experience because blah, 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 or that was really challenging. And now I can see looking back that it made me explore certain things or need to ex need have certain needs that I didn't know how to express. You know, this is what I needed was whatever, but I just didn't know how to tell you. So that was all that I was able to do. It doesn't mean that a, a parent failed at understanding. It's just, this is, this is the amount that I'm able to do today. There could also be the aspect that a child feels afraid or uncomfortable or uncertain and they want to they want to do the best they can too so they might need some time before they're ready to share what portions they are able to share um to sleep on it or to just see like oh i can take my time and approach mom or dad about this later they're giving me space for this and, and then they could take initiative to share as well. That said, you don't have to feel like walking on eggshells or like, should I ask, should I not ask? Anything like that. It's okay. You know, there's that really, there's that, there's that bond of parent child. And it's told, it, it's just part of life to ask every, each day, like, hey, how are you doing? What's going on? What do you need to do? Et cetera. Like that's just normal parent child conversation. So feel free to check in and ask as well and circle around, um, but also know that whatever they have to say is most likely a reflection of what they're able to verbalize at this time um, for whatever reason, whether it's like an emotional reason or a verbal place of I don't have the words right now, or um, this is kind of challenging, but I kind of want to figure it out myself first before I get all that extra help and um, from a person of authority. And, um, and then other times it might be, I don't want to let my parent down. I don't want to make them not proud of me. I don't want to, whatever. So they might be afraid to share as well, or, and there's so many reasons. 
all that to say in the shortest version is similar to you know the spirit of our conversation today of whatever you feel comfortable sharing you're more than welcome to share and whatever you're not comfortable sharing you don't have to share so sharing as much as you're comfortable you can share that with your child as well so that they know that there is an open door to share with you in the future or right now um, whenever is whenever feels doable for them because they know that it's always approachable for you and that also leaves um, by having that door there instead of like a in this time we are only doing this now by having the door there it allows the artwork or other creative self-expression process to become their own that they can process for themselves that they can find answers for for themselves as well and um and it and it relieves some of relieves some of the uncertainty and the and the control that the adult has to have to find all the answers right now and solutions right now um I know that with my answer, I didn't really tap into the possibilities, mostly because I, I know that you're a good person and like I know you, so I didn't really tap into those other areas of like, well, what if a child is being abused at home and things like that. This is more of a conversation, not just knowing, you know, the three of us. So hopefully um, others who come to see the recording of this, of today's tutorial and workshop and conversation can adapt the information for their unique situations and um, particular needs. Thank you so much for your, thank you guys so much for participating and for your thoughtful questions and for sharing from the heart. It is wonderful to spend some of this morning with you. Um, and I hope you have a really great rest of your day. In closing for this recorded section of the video, I just wanna say, um, please connect like subscribe etc with with uh with me here please feel free to join the facebook self-care group and i will continue to share information in hopes that it can help everyone self-care and um maintain or create more peace of mind through these times of coronavirus pandemic thank you all and see you next time